Welcome to Laurier's Teaching Excellence Conversation Series. I'm Mary Wilson, Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at Wilfrid Laurier University. And today I'm with Jennifer Holm from Laurier's Faculty of Education. Jennifer is dedicated to making mathematics accessible to the next generation of children by training the next generation of teachers. She's been working to indigenize the mathematics curriculum and employs a flipped classroom model to both engage her students and make their education more flexible during the pivot to remote teaching. Jennifer's reputation as a trusted expert in mathematics education and a passionate and enthusiastic teacher make her an excellent recipient of the Early Career Excellence Award. And I'm excited to get to talk to her. Let's start by talking about some of the innovative work that you've done in your courses to incorporate experiential and active learning in, in math education. Can you talk a little bit about your decision making around the integration of active and experiential education? Okay, so I, I've been teaching for more than 20 years. I, I started very early um, and I'd always wanted to be a teacher. That was just part of growing up. Um, you know, once I realized it was too clumsy to be a ballerina, I wanted to be a teacher. And it's just been this goal to kind of get to that point. And when I started teaching, I hated math. I, I hated teaching math. Uh, the kids hated doing math. Uh, I was in the U.S. at the time, and I would show them I had the manipulatives in my classroom. I'd show them how to use them, but really um, it was what I've been calling procedures with pictures. I was teaching them how to use the tools in a very procedural way, which doesn't help. So of course they hated it, and of course I hated teaching it because they weren't getting it, and especially my really struggling learners, it was making things worse, and I didn't know enough about the research to change it to do anything different. I was just basically doing what I had been taught in teacher college, or at least what I interpreted I had been taught in teacher's college. So um, I decided to take a pause and get my master's degree, and I was going to do it in literacy. I, I really, that was my passion. I was well known in the area for teaching literacy. And I took a math course in my master's just because I needed a course to fill avoid um, and nothing else seemed interesting. So I took this course and on the very first day, they gave me an activity with uh, unifix cubes and it was about algebra. And for the first time in my life, algebra made sense. And it was just this aha moment that I couldn't describe because I'd always disliked math. I'd been fine, my grades were great, I was able to memorize, but for me, unlike languages where there was so much beauty and math was just black and white, it was boring, it was memorizing formulas that made no sense, it was regurgitating answers, it was about speed, I didn't like any of it. Now for the first time, math made sense. And something that I had struggled with and I'd memorized the formulas, now there was a reason. And it was just one of those life-changing kind of moments. And I went up to my instructor afterwards and immediately asked her to be my supervisor. And didn't even hesitate. Like I knew that I needed to change directions. I needed to push myself. I needed to stretch. So um, it was through her that I started teaching uh, math courses at the university level. And it was always a bit of a struggle because I had a degree in elementary education. I didn't have a math degree. And here I am teaching others. And I felt like I was learning as much as they were as I was teaching, which was really disconcerting when I started out. Um, but I realize now that learning from them is the best teacher and the best way to learn new ways of looking at mathematics because it's not just one right way. It's not just one single path from start to finish. So giving them experiences where, like I would with children in a classroom, give them some manipulatives, give them a problem to solve, 
and then stand back and watch the magic and wander around and just ask questions, the things that I'd want them to do in their own elementary school classrooms. And I think by doing that, it kind of takes some of the, the stress out of being in a university classroom. They're playing with tools, they're playing with things, and I'm very upfront that these are the things I'd want them to do with kids. And by saying that, it gives most of them a license to say, you know what, if I don't know, this is what I would do with children. So it's really important to me to model what I'd like to see them doing in their own classrooms. Being curious about what they're, at, what they're doing and saying, asking questions if I don't know, if they've come up with something I've never seen before, stopping and saying, I've not seen that before, can you explain it to me? And really, um, in math education, they, they call it defronting the classroom. So I'm not the sage on the stage with all the right answers. I'm wandering through and I'm asking the questions and I'm letting them share. And yes, there's a lot of fear around mathematics and there's a lot of tears uh, and there's a lot of anxiety around being in that classroom and I understand all of those pieces. So it takes a while for some of them to feel comfortable and confident to just share their answers even when they are brilliant and they don't realize it. But so many times they don't realize the brilliance of their answers. So a lot of my job is to help them understand that just because the way they did it wasn't the same as their neighbors, that's okay and that's what's good. That's going to help them as teachers because they need to see all these different ways. So you've dealt very directly with the role of emotion as both a barrier and a lever for learning in the classroom and empowered um, initial teachers with some very specific skill sets and practices that they can employ in their own classrooms. So what's your, your biggest wish or piece of advice for uh, teachers who are helping students to learn complex, challenging subject matter, whether it's mathematics or some other significant concept or process that is just daunting for them? Math is one of those things that you either love it or you hate it. There doesn't seem to be a lot of middle ground with it. Um, and it's a really interesting conversation starter when I say, oh, I teach mathematics. I either have people, like I've had people physically recoil from me. <laughs> oh, well, uh, like there's something, you know, absolutely brilliant about the fact that I teach mathematics. And I think that for me, my greatest wish would be that that didn't happen anymore. Because I, I think the thing that I talk about on my very first class, and I, I put it right out there, I do an activity on the very first day, and I get them to voice their hatred of mathematics, their fear of mathematics, uh, in an activity where they're not owning up to it, they're reading somebody else's thoughts. So it, it lessens the, the floor on um, feeling like people are looking. And some people still kind of go with the safe answers and aren't honest. But about halfway through the room while they're reading these and people have said, you know, really strong, like, I hate this or I'm scared or whatever, then you notice that there's a little subtle shift and there's a little bit more giggling in the classroom because they suddenly realize they're not alone. And that's what we talk about is um, there has been this idea that when you can't do mathematics, you're by yourself. You're the only person who can't do it. So having people understand that um, it's not that they can't do mathematics, it's they can't do it yet. They haven't been instructed in a way that helps them embrace mathematics. And it's my goal is not to have everybody be the next Albert Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein or um, solve the great problems of the world but to be able to comfortably use mathematics and to understand how often you're using mathematics on a daily basis. You can't avoid it. You, you can't, um, whether it's, and I use the example in my class, you know, when that engine light comes on to tell you that you're out of gas, you do a mental calculation to find out, are you gonna make it to the gas station that you know has the cheapest price, especially right now? So you're using math but you're not pulling out a calculator and you're not calculating it down to the exact thing, which is what school mathematics would teach us is what math is. Um, so I think that shift and a, an understanding that 
memorizing formulas and quickly reciting procedures is not mathematics. That is this school math thing and mathematics is something different. It's bigger than that. And if that understanding would shift, I think it would change a lot more of what individuals feel about mathematics itself and about teaching mathematics because you know I teach future teachers if they're afraid and they go into a classroom and say I'm afraid you're giving those students license to say okay I'm afraid I don't have to do this or um, and I say the the one thing that I don't want anybody to ever say to children is I couldn't do math because you're telling them it's okay not to be able to do it it's okay not to try I said it with parents who would come in and say, oh, well, I wasn't good at math. Well, it's not a gene. <laughs> you know, there, there's something different going on there. So that open-mindedness that, um, that it's not a badge of honor to tell people, I can't do math. I think it's, it's so insightful and we often forget as educators that our students come into the classroom space, we come into the classroom space freighted with emotion. Absolutely. around our learning and our capacity and the difficulty of the subject matter and bound up with wishes and hopes about how we're going to perform in our learning within that uh, classroom environment. So you clearly advise uh, the teachers that you're educating on dealing foregrounding that that emotion in the classroom and, and dealing with it head on. Um, you also uh, make very explicit use of heuristics or tools or manipulables so that people can find a variety of ways to think about math and uh, the relationship of theory to practice in math. And um, you, you also talk about how you guide uh, overt discourse in the, in the classroom, which I think is, is a a brilliant sort of combination of strategies, including defronting the classroom, that I think probably has much broader application in teaching practice across a variety of disciplines. Uh, and I know that you've done some research in this area as well, and that you've been recognized a, a, not only as an early career educator, uh, but also as an early career researcher. So how is it that you um, would advise colleagues or initial teachers who are perhaps doing action research or referring to the literature in their disciplines to deliberately integrate, to bring research into the classroom on a dynamic basis? So what, what would you suggest that we do to think about the connection between our research and our teaching practice? So, I mean, as, as teachers and educators, we want to see our students succeed. So in order for us to understand how they're succeeding and why they're not, the research is a great tool to help us understand what is working well and what maybe needs to shift. And I think for me, teaching has always been an iterative process. And I, I, I tell my students this, uh, that if there were ever two years where I felt like I was doing exactly the same things, I realized I'd stopped growing and I'd stopped paying attention to my students. Because your students every year are going to change. So every year we should be changing our practices and we should be considering who the new bodies in those rooms are. And I, there's some activities I use every year because they've worked so brilliantly. Um, but for the most part, every year there's something different. There's something new I bring in. Whether it's um, results from going to conferences and things like that and reading about other people's research or the acknowledgements uh, so most of my research has been focusing on the emotions, which obviously became really clear early in my career that I couldn't do my job unless I took care of those first. Whether they loved math or they hated math, both needed something. The people who loved math were determined that because they loved it, they just needed to do exactly what they were do that was done with them. So getting them to open their minds up and realize that some of the exact same practices were used on their classmates and led them to hate and fear mathematics. So we can't do a one-size-fits-all. 
And I think as educators at the university level, I think that's the important piece too. It isn't one size fits all. Um, and that all students need something different. So being able to focus on addressing what I noticed was happening in the classroom and then using research to answer the questions that I had. So the emotions, um, I knew they were there. I could see them, you could feel them in my classroom. Uh, why were they there? And that became kind of, it wasn't where I started with my research, but it became where I realized I needed to go and to understand their past because they were bringing them into my classroom. And yes, I could make changes and I understood the changes that I was making in my classroom and how I was having an impact. But I realized that if I really wanted to make shifts, I needed to know what was happening before they got to my classroom so that I could help them understand what they could do differently in their classrooms to stop it. So I, I always say that um, I want my research to become obsolete because I'd like one day to be able to come into my class on the first day and not have people where I can see them visibly shaking or on the verge of tears or um, that anger. I mean, I've had students go out in the hallway to scream because they've been so anxious and so frustrated. And that's years of been built up uh, difficulties. So understanding where those come from has really been key to helping me understand what I can do in my classroom. And you know, I have things in my office that normal university professors probably don't have. I have a bulk supply of Kleenexes, but also um, fidget bins that you use in classrooms so that when they come in, if they need to do something uh, to kind of decrease their anxiety, it's a really simple thing to do, but it's something that I've learned for years of working with these students and really paying attention to my research on helping it inform so that I can do my job better but I can also now work on stopping the problem before they get to me through the teachers that I work with. Very much the case, yeah. And it, it sounds as though you spend a, a good amount of time cultivating an interpretive lens for educators as well as a robust tool set that they can employ. So could you articulate that a little bit in terms of, you know, if you're advising um, an initial teacher candidate, on how to investigate the learning environment in the classroom and understand how students are approaching a particular math concept, for example, and what decision-making they need to pursue as an educator to shift tactics, uh, to shift focus, to lend support, and what kind of support to provide. So how deliberately, overtly, do you work uh, initial teacher candidates through that kind of development? So a lot of it, because um, I work mainly with the first years, um, so a lot of it I talk about as modeling. And so there's a, a really unique kind of dynamic in my classroom where I treat them like I would elementary school students, and then I step out of it and we talk about exactly what I did and what they noticed. So go meta. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, we talk about specifically, um, so we do activities. One of the, the things that I like to talk to them about is one of the biggest mistakes that we can make as teachers is answering some of their questions, <laughs> which actually seems counterintuitive that when they ask, um, so questions like, am I right? Or um, is this what I'm supposed to do? Questions uh, that in the research they call them stop thinking questions because no matter what I answer, the student's gonna shut down. If I tell them they're right, they're done. They don't need to do anything more. If I tell them they're wrong, for a lot of them they're done because now they're frustrated right. and they, they don't know what to do next. So navigating that, but I'm working with adults who have had years of when they ask a question, am I right? Somebody tells them the answer. Right. <laughs> so I intentionally don't. And it makes them really uncomfortable. Um, and a lot of times in mathematics, 
when a student asks you a question like, am I right? And you answer, ask them a question back, or if they share their answer and you ask them a question, it's because they're wrong and you want them to figure out what they did wrong. And it's a, te it's a technique that was taught to me in university as a teacher that this is what you do to help them see their errors. So you internalize the idea that when a teacher asks me a question, I'm wrong. And even as adults, they start backtracking. And even though they've given a brilliant answer, but because I've asked a question, suddenly they're not confident anymore. And suddenly they're trying to figure out where they went wrong. So then taking those moments to step out and say, okay, A, how did it make you feel? Because we need to tackle that because, yeah, I know it made you uncomfortable. I watched you. <laughs> I know immediately what did you think. Well, I was wrong. So I needed to fix my answer. So making sure that they understand that the moves that I'm making as a teacher are to help them and why. So then we can talk about what the research says, why I do these things. Um, because they're unintentional cues to students that either they're wrong or they don't know or um, that they can just stop thinking. And that suddenly I'm, again, putting myself as I'm the authority, I have all the answers, and your job is to figure out what's in my head. And that's not what I want my students to do, and that's not what I'd want children to do either, but I want individuals to think for themselves. And I need to give them the tools to think for themselves, whatever that happens to be in whatever subject it is. So little things like not acknowledging, are you right or wrong? Not um, immediately validating answers and saying, good job, even. So even when they share things and they're right, I don't validate it because I want them to continue to talk about it. I want their peers to ask them questions. I want them to kind of do that. I'm carefully navigating the conversation. So sometimes I need to highlight my role because especially with those who are really afraid of mathematics, they get so caught up in just the moment and just trying to think of what this answer means right. that yeah. they're not able to yet reflect on some of those bigger things. So my job is to kind of pull them out and talk about it um, and provide them resources where they can go to get those answers. Because really, if they're not comfortable with the topic, then they're going to have a hard time teaching it themselves. So where can they go to get more comfortable? So a lot of what I do is just doing mathematics like elementary school students would do so that they can start to gain that comfort because with that comfort is going to change the way they can do that in their classroom. Because it's really easy to follow a textbook. It's really easy to stand at the front of the room and just lecture at somebody and tell them, this is what I need you to do. But I think in the long term, we're doing some harm because now we're creating individuals who aren't thinking for themselves. And, and that's what we need. That's, it, it's extraordinary that you can sort of lay that bare in terms of the, the process that you undertake, what you're trying to accomplish uh, with the teaching practice and how you're framing things and that you pause and explain it the way that you do and then model it and allow others to find their comfort within that kind of methodology and to learn to trust it because they experiment with it and see the consequence in the learners as well. That I think is just, um, yeah, it's brilliant to hear. About it. <laughs> yeah, it may sound sort of simple and obvious uh, to you, but I think it is uh, really quite extraordinary. Uh, I want to talk as well about um, what you have done with your colleagues uh, as well as individually uh, to bring indigenization and decolonization into uh, math education. Uh, because many would s find that a very difficult uh, thing to, to think how, how, to, how to approach it. Uh, so how did you approach it and what was your experience with indigenization and decolonization? Such a, a great question because you're right. There, there seems to be, um, I, I mean, even the news around the new Ontario math curriculum that they pulled out any mentions of equity because yeah. math is... Um, completely objective. It's not something that has these, you know, gradations or things. And I think it's exactly the opposite of that. Uh, because even, you know, the, the ways we teach certain ideas are very Western. Um, 
And how we teach a math class sometimes is very Western, and I think that's, that's problematic. And part of the problem is not just about indigenizing um, for you know, indigenous populations, but also for the learners who have typically been left behind, and there are a lot of learners. Uh, math has become a very elite subject that very selective, you know, very selective, yeah. and it's this idea of you know there's those who can and those who can't, and I think that's part of the problem. And I know it becomes a power shift in taking away because if we can open it up and say, well, everybody can do it, suddenly that selective elite group is no longer special. And I think that's where some of those pushbacks are. And I could tell lots of horror stories of where I've had personal pushbacks on those things. But to, to answer the question, I think the, the most profound piece that I, I learned, and I, I will admit that when I started out, that wasn't at the forefront of my mind um, because I was just trying to open doors with mathematics and I wanted doors opened for everyone. And what I found later is the things that I was doing without realizing it were indigenizing the curriculum and I didn't understand it. And I actually, I save that lesson with my teacher candidates until later because I don't want them to feel like it's a performative piece. Like I, so I embed it into my practice and then I let them learn about it and their reflection always is, well, that's what you've been doing all along. So that they understand themselves. It's not, it's not about just the content. And I, I went to a, a session one time uh, and they were talking about how to kind of embed indigenous ways of knowing in mathematics. And when I left, one of the uh, participants in the session said, well, when you talk about rates of change, you just put them in a canoe instead of walking, and now you've indigenized it. And that was where I was afraid we would go with things, that as, kind this of performative. Tokenism, yes, because it's not that. It's not as <clears throat> consequential as the learning that comes from a deeper practice yes. and the orientation to thinking around math education. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the most profound thing I learned was um, Lisa Lenny Borden has done a lot of work around verbifying math. Yes. And yeah. making it, because um, in math, it's a lot of nouns. It's a lot of things. Whereas if we are doing mathematics and we are, um, you know, looking at the actions, this verbifying idea really helps all learners embrace mathematics. They need to be doing. It's not about calculating. It's about um, the thinking and the pieces and there are some brilliant examples of, um, like when we talk about circles, um, she uses an example of a, a porcupine quill box. And that when it's a, a quill box, that you go the di um, diameter, you go three and a thumb. Because it's that pi, three, <laughs> and that little bit more. But when you're making something bigger, like a drum, now all of a sudden you need to do three of the diameter and a hand. Why? and getting students to think about it. So it's a beautiful, brilliant example where you can talk about what the significance of the porcupine quill box is, what the significance of the drum is, but also that mathematics. And I think I went to a session, um, it's before COVID now, uh, so it's been a few years with um, Ruth Beatty, who's here in Ontario. and. The one important lesson that I pulled out of that is the point of in bringing in these indigenous ways of knowing and the indigenous content is not to serve the math. The math is to serve these ideas. So you need to start with the idea and talking about it and talking about, um, you know, if you're bringing in beading, what is the significance of the beading and letting the math come out of it as opposed to well, we're doing patterns, so we're going to make beaded bracelets or wampum belts or, you know, these very tokenistic ways of talking about it, but we're going to do patterns. Instead, let's engage with a community member in the content and learn about the significance of this item and let the math come out of that and let that be the way to 
um, work it instead of forefronting it. And I think that's probably the most respectful kind of way that I've learned um, to really focus in on those ideas. And I think the struggle for me has been a lot of my students aren't ready for that because they still need you know, with patterns, they don't understand the connection to algebra yet. So oh, we need to work on building those understandings. So verbifying the math and making sure they're doing and engaging and talking about it has to happen first. And then we can get into these ideas. So that's why I expose them to it a little later. And in year two, then we can expand a little bit more. But since I mainly work with the year ones, just so that I can kind of lay that foundation um, that's where I've kind of situated myself right now and just opening their eyes to how these ideas are not just helping some. It's helping all learners understand, even the ones who you give them a formula and they can spit out an answer. Do they really understand the mathematics or do they just know how to compute an answer? And I think that's a different question. Yes. And we need to really look at those things too that just because they're getting right answers doesn't mean they actually understand what they're doing very much the case yes so sp speaking about the challenges with uh the curriculum now for k-12 educators and authentic indigenization and decolonization among a number of different challenges um i imagine that you are deliberately preparing resilience and thoughtfulness and comprehensiveness and broad-based understanding in your students before they go out into practice to help um, prepare them for uh, encountering those um, the consequences of those structural challenges in their classrooms. What makes you hopeful right now in this time of, of great difficulty for classroom educators? I always say that I'm not looking for them to tell me at the end that they love mathematics. Because I know for some of them, it's a lot of years of that damage that I am trying to undo. So if they can get to the end of my class and say, I think I can do it, to me, I've done my job. Because they came in thinking they couldn't, they would never be able to do this, and that maybe this career isn't something that's meant for them because of one stumbling block. and. Um, you know, it's not to say every student is successful in my class. Sometimes my job is to help them understand that another year is going to do a lot of good. And those are hard conversations to have, especially if they're doing really well in everything else. But sometimes those conversations need to be had because the consequences of not doing it means that they're going to create learners like them in the future because they're just not ready. Um, and it, it's the not ready piece. And I, I would like to see more of an understanding that uh, you can be a gifted, brilliant teacher and you may not be ready to teach math yet. And, and it would go the same with any subject. But I think with math, it's become this um, politicized weapon sometimes <laughs> right. to talk about. Yeah. Um, and it's used in ways and then it's filtered onto teachers, like teachers are doing a bad job. And I don't believe that. I mean, there's obviously going to be teachers who aren't doing a great job, but more than anything that what I'm learning is they're not equipped with the skills that they need to do better. They don't understand yet, or they don't understand that what they're doing is causing harm. They're very well-meaning. They think that this is what they understand. And I think back to when I started teaching, and I was doing a lot of the exact same things because I thought that's what we were supposed to do. And I was going to training that was telling me that, you know, you have to use problem solving in your classroom. Well, they taught us that it means you put a word problem on the board, you show kids how to solve it, and then you give them examples where you just change the numbers or the context. Right. Yeah. And they're problem solving. Well, no, they're doing calculating with words. It's different. Problem solving is giving them a task or an activity and not telling them what to do, letting them figure it out, but giving them the tools and the guidance to help them. It's a subtle shift, 
but it's a really important one. And, you know, there's a lot of great things that the three-part math lesson you start by introducing, you give kids time to work on it, and then you do the consolidation. Well, the consolidation isn't a chance for every child to share everything that they thought about. Well, because then you're going to be there for days and you're not <laughs> going to get anywhere. The consolidation is actually the hardest part of the lesson to teach because you have to anticipate what are students going to do and how are you going to structure sharing those so that they get the main idea. How are you going to help lead them towards whatever the curriculum goal is? So those shifts are really subtle ones, but I think the new curriculum is set up in such a way that allows for some of those holds to be addressed as they go on since the kind of overall goals are consistent from grade one to eight. Uh, so there should be time to go back <clears throat> and focus on you know things that they might have missed earlier. So it's a step in the right direction but I think the other piece that needs to happen is helping support them understand that why are these pieces there? Why are they important? Because um, any child psychology class is going to tell you no two learners are going to move at the same pace. There is no such thing as a normal child. Um, but it's about, you know, changing uh, ways of working with things. And just because they haven't gotten there, that it doesn't mean they're never going to. They just haven't gotten there yet. And yet our school system and curriculum is built around the idea that you need them to hit these major milestones yes. all at the same time by yeah. birth date. So I, I think the overall idea behind the math curriculum gives me some hope on that. And then working with the new teachers to help them really understand and really confront what is their goal in the classroom. Is it to go through and check off that they have managed to <laughs> cover everything yes. in the curriculum yeah. or that they want their students to understand the ideas so that they're ready to move forward and think for themselves and it's hearing that hope on um, especially the the learners who struggled that there's something different and maybe their students won't struggle the same way they had and I think that's for me the most kind of important piece is you know it's it's not a it's not a simple problem it's not just changing the curriculum it's about making sure that we're supporting individuals to understand not only what it means but give them the tools so that they can do it effectively and um, the ones who are the most afraid aren't usually the ones who are going to reach out for help because it, it, there's a lot of vulnerability absolutely risk. in uh, yeah. in that and you know teachers I, I always remember when I was younger um, and I was going through teachers college the, one of my last professors flippantly said at the end, welcome to the fishbowl. And I never understood really until I was teaching what that meant. But as a teacher, it's like living in a fishbowl. Yes. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you are probably going to run into somebody. And there is a, right or wrong, there's a judgment that comes with seeing you in, you know, a, a different situation um, and you're on display, and a, a lot of times you're blamed for things you shouldn't be blamed for. It's a Absolutely. hard, hard it's a very profession to get complex into. Complex profession. Absolutely. Yeah. So understanding, and you know, if your bottom line is I want to do what's best for my learners, and that's become kind of my motto through everything is I want to do what's best for my learners. And sometimes it's not something that they think is best for them. Uh, it's helping them understand that maybe you know a little bit more time or a little bit more focus on that is important that um, that's going to be the way to kind of move forward my thanks to jennifer holm for joining me today and i hope that you'll join me for more conversations that celebrate exceptional teaching practices explore diverse teaching philosophies and discuss the future of higher education teaching and learning